Excellent. Uh, so I'd first like to thank the organizers for inviting me and apologize for not being there in person. We had a COVID exposure, uh, which prevented me from traveling. Um, but I would dearly like to be at the beer garden with you all tonight for dinner. It sounds great, much better than what I have planned. Right, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing modeling viral rebound. And I'll define that in a moment, but first let's place HIV in context. Uh-oh. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with uh, something. There we go. Right, so HIV in the world, there are roughly 38 million people living with HIV today. Uh, 680,000 individuals uh, died of AIDS-related illness um, in 2020, or at least that's the estimate. Um, but this, this map above is a prevalence map, just indicating the, the concentration of HIV cases throughout the world. The darker colors indicate higher prevalence and the lighter colors indicate lower prevalence. And uh, the thing that I, th it's an older map, but I like it because it really highlights the fact that the South Africa in particular is very badly hit by HIV with roughly one in five people there infected. Germany is much better off, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any cases here. Roughly the estimates are, recent estimates have that 93,000 um, Germans are living with HIV with 2,600 new diagnoses in 2020. And uh, a little more context. Uh, so just in comparison to other human diseases, the Ebola outbreak was scary, terrifying. In the end, there are about 12,000 deaths. Um, that's less than there are from HIV every week. COVID, however, has outlapped HIV pretty significantly. Uh, but there are some hypotheses that it, um, COVID viral replication in immunocompromised individuals like HIV positive individuals may be what is accelerating um, viral mutation and give, may be contributing to the new strains that we're seeing. Um, HCV is also better represented. And although there are good antiviral therapies now that cure most cases, what the issue is now is access for those. So we've got 58 million people living with HCV and 290,000 deaths. Um, but co-infection with HIV is common. So 8.6% of H German HCV cases are um, with HV HIV. And they are all beat out by TB. Uh, tuberculosis, which is something that I'm just getting into studying as well. Uh, there are a lot of COVID cases in the world. 10 million new TB infections and 1.5 million deaths in 2020. And uh, co-infection with TB leads to, is thought to be the cause of approximately one in five HIV AIDS deaths. Um, and also herpes viruses, since we've spent a lot of time listening to beautiful talks from Matthew Reeves and Lior about uh, herpes viruses, it bears mentioning that uh, genital herpes are associated with an increased risk of HIV infection. Kaposi sarcoma has been mentioned, which is associated with, I think it was HHV8, um, or Kaposi sarcoma, oh shoot, shoot um, KSHV, it's an early hallmark of AIDS pre-art. Um, and it's thought that still the risk of KS is higher in people living with HIV. That's what that acronym means. And uh, CMV, well, in utero HIV infection may be a major risk factor for congenital CMV in infants whose mothers aren't on ART during pregnancy. So that's a little more context for HIV. I work at the within host level. I, I'm interested, one of the areas I'm interested in is the notion of cure and functional cure. So this is Timothy Brown. Some of you are likely familiar with it. Many of you may be familiar with this case. He is the Berlin patient. He identified himself as Timothy Brown in 2010. He is the, this, the, the poster is old. It says the only man cured of HIV. There has been since two more men cured of HIV using the same protocol, which is to say, he was HIV positive, and then he developed leukemia. Uh, he went to a doctor in, uh, in Berlin, Dr. Hüter was who he was referred to, um, when it came time for a transplant to be his, uh, one of his treatment options, there were a lot of matches. So Dr. Hüter was like, hey, let's look for HIV resistant marrow. And they used that and it worked. In addition to incredibly aggressive therapy, that transplant, cured his HIV. He was HIV free up until his death from cancer in 2020, because 2020 was the worst year ever. Um, perhaps not ever, but it was a terrible year. 
there have since been two men cured in the same way. But this is not a scalable invention an intervention, right? So great, they're cured, but you can't go around performing stem cell, hemopoietic stem cell transplants in South Africa. Uh, still, it gives us a clue that the, that HIV really is a disease of the immune response, and it's in the immune response that's the goal, that's the um, target, main targets. Uh, what might be achievable is something called functional cure, and I'll revisit this picture in a moment, but it's the idea that you have HIV in your body, but it's controlled. So that's what this picture briefly represents. The gray shaded area is uh, a duration of treatment for this individual. The white area is when they're not treated, and the blue dots represent the amount of virus in their system. This low point indicates that it's undetectable. So this person is controlled for years without treatment. This is the idea of a functional cure. So functional cure may be achievable. It's in the immune responses. And there are a number of strategies under investigation that target specifically the immune system. Right, so um, I model HIV and the life cycle. This is familiar, we've seen um, the HSV life cycle, uh, CMV life cycle, and other HSV life cycles here. Uh, this was briefly touched on by Lior as well, but essentially um, HIV attaches to the target cell, which are CD4 positive T cells, dumps out its genetic machinery, transcribes itself, and integrates into the host cell genome. So that's one of the things that's special about HIV and important for latency. Then hijacks the cell's machinery to make copies of itself and repeat. Now, I do within host modeling, and I mention this specifically because within host modeling crudely takes this viral replication cycle and um, presents a simple picture that has been incredibly in, brought incredible insights. So we've got our target cells, um, uh, our target cells which can become infected by virus to make infected cells and produce more virus. That's the level of the individual. Now we've heard a lot about the um, molecular biology level and cellular level. I actually work at the level of populations of cells. So let's look at the population of, of at the body level. So this is a cartoon hijacked from Wik Wikimedia on the time course of HIV infection in hosts. So in red, we have the amount of virus and in blue, the target cells, the CD4 positive T cells. So you're exposed to HIV and then there's a stochastic phase. Uh, it's not clear, the, the exact precise events between exposure and full-blown infection aren't totally elucidated yet, but eventually it, it becomes quite high. Viral load, sorry, virus has spread through the body and the amount of virus in the plasma grows exponentially, reaches a peak and then decays. This is well explained by what's called target cell limitation in the model, but there are alternative hypotheses around immune response activity as well. Viral load comes down. Then it hits a chronic phase of infection where the viral load remains roughly constant. Note that the x-axis here is switched from weeks to years for a long time until your immune system is sufficiently ravaged. We see that in blue with the CD4 counts that drop slowly, that you fall prey to opportunistic infections, Kaposi sarcoma, Rheumatoid carini being the big ones that were noticed at first, and um, you die. So that's the time course of the, that was the picture in the 80s and the uh, early 90s. But fortunately, we have antiretroviral, we have really good drugs now. And these drugs are uh, target different phases of the replication cycle. For example, reverse transcriptors inhibitors prevent reverse transcription. Uh, protease inhibitors prevent um, or, or interfere with viral production, I should say. Uh, these were the first two main classes of drugs. AZT, the famous first drug of HIV, was a reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We now also have fusion inhibitors, which prevent the virus from attaching to the host cell, and integrase inhibitors, which, which prevent viral genome from integrating into the, um, into the nuclear, into the genome. And so what these do is they drop the viral load really dramatically and increase the CD4 counts. And, and permit the CD4 counts to recover somewhat. The degree of recovery there really depends on at what stage of infection target therapy is initiated. Now for his, scientific history buffs, this is where, um, this is where the in-host modeling really made its first big splashy impact. So 
we took this, the standard viral, the now standard viral dynamics model was an ODE model expressed on the right here. It's a simple nonlinear model, very closely related to say SIR models or predator prey models. I treated infection. These three panels are, uh, they show the three um, HIV positive individuals who started their therapy. The dots represent their viral loads over time in days. The solid line is a model fit. These model fits have been very successfully used to characterize HIV before and out of onset of treatment, estimated things like viral clearance rates, for, uh, um, infected cell death rates, et cetera. A lot of our knowledge of HIV comes from data with models. This paper, I believe, has been cited something like 10,000 times. Um, so they're very well-cited papers. Now, when these treatments first came out and these results first came out, it was, it was thought that this was it. And it was great excitement. It was like, okay, our calculations on this exponential decay phase say, well, give it six months, you're cured. We know now that that was, and, and we knew shortly thereafter, that unfortunately that was not the case. If you interrupt treatment, if you stop treatment, then viral loads recover and CD4 counts drop and the infection progresses. So this is the typical case. Um, and we now have a very well accepted hypothesis as to why, and that's these viral latency. Uh, these latently infected cells, which are quiet after viral DNA integration. And that small glib sentence covers up everything that was discussed this morning for you guys very early this morning for me. But the, um, the important parts from my standpoint, from my modeling here is that this, this, the reservoir of these cells, it was mentioned that they have a long half-life. Half-life is like 44 months. It's been estimated to be about 44 months on average. There's significant variability. The size of the reservoir is also quite variable. The average is one per 10 to the six CD4 positive T cells. And that may not sound like a lot, but it is enough that in the presence of art, there is a half-life, the reservoir is decaying, but it, it, you're not gonna, it's not gonna decay sufficiently in, in a lifetime. Like that's not, that viral, that reservoir is not going away. And these cells can activate and produce HIV, our definition of latency, because they can activate. And they are thought to cause reseed infection and initiate viral rebound post-treatment interruption. Right, so that's our picture. Um, now, this is the area that I'm interested in, this viral rebound, but I want to point out that there's significant heterogeneity in viral rebound. It's not just one nice smooth average curve. Indeed, these are, <clears throat> this is, here is data on um, 200 some odd individuals following their treatment interruption at time zero. The corners represent data points. The lines are just there to connect the dots, so it's not a mass of dots. And we see there's there's, there's pretty big variability. I mean, there's, um, everything seems to come back within a couple of months in most cases, but there are exceptions. There are also qualitative differences in the way, of vi the way virus comes back. So I have two questions that I wanna to talk to you about today with regards to this viral rebound. When it occurs, right, when, but also if. That's the, and I wanna start by talking about if. And this harkens back to that functional cure slide that I, um, image that I showed you before. That was from a study published in 2013 by Say Serio Nadal. This is the Visconti cohort, where they did a perspective, a, a retrospective analysis of HIV positive individuals and found that 14 out of six, 164 um, people living with HIV in their study showed what they defined to be post-treatment control. So using this, First panel as the um, example. Again, we have blue is the viral load. Gray, the, the time is in years. And um, okay, you probably can't see this because it's really small, but these are on the spans of decades is, is the time. And these are calendar years in case you're wondering why they differ, can see well enough and can wonder why they're different from person to person. So gray shaded area treated, white area untreated. This person, this individual when a treat, when, underwent a treatment interruption they had nice undetectable viral loads, they stopped their therapy and they kept maintaining that nice undetectable viral load for seven years. The 
median here was I think seven and a half years. The range is four to 10 years in which these individuals were controlling HIV. It was as though they were treated without treatment. And this is incredible. It's just amazing. This cohort has been sustained. I've read that they have up to 20 individuals now that have been controlling for a very long time. So identifying, and identifying individuals and even trying to induce this kind of post-treatment control would be great. But first we have to understand why. Why are they controlling? So we posed a hypothesis. Now, one of the things I didn't mention that these individuals all had in common was that they were treated early, shortly after exposure, within three months or thereabouts. So we hypothesized that maybe they're controlling because they, this limited the seeding of latent reservoir. But then we, then, um, then we hypothesized further that, well, sure, there's still activation of latently infected cells post-treatment interruption and pre-treatment interruption, but that's controlled by treatment. Uh, so, sure that, so what what will control it will be immune responses, and we'll focus on the role of effector cells, which are well have long been thought to be the primary immune mechanism controlling HIV. Although that can be a bit controversial, but we focus on effector cells. Um, but then you might ask yourself, okay, well then why does virus ever rebound if effector cells can control rebound? Well, effector cells can also there's a phenomenon known as immune exhaustion that some of you may be some or most of you may be familiar with where um, overstimulation can cause uh, exhaustion of immune responses. And so we tried to model this hypothesis. Now we put together, and this is our simple model. We've got, you see, you'll notice we have the standard viral dynamics model here embedded because a lot of viral dynamics, if not most viral dynamics is um, an extension or a modification of the standard dynamics. We've added latently infected cells. So a fraction of new cell infections can become latently infected, which then activate to, make, to be productively infected, which again is a hypothesis that that's the exact pathway. But, um, and then infected cells, well, um, effector cell dynamics, effector cells are stimulated by the presence of foreign antigen. And we use the infected cell population as a proxy for that. The effector cells can proliferate and die and effector cells enhance CT, um, killing of the infected cells. We also have a mechanism in the model, which I will show next. Um, the in infected cells, again, as a proxy for the amount of foreign pathogen in the system, can also overstimulate the effector cells and induce exhaustion. So these are the ODEs corresponding to the compartmental model I showed you on the previous slide. So I, for, for those of you that, um, are very quick and get something out of ODEs. I don't always myself. What I would like to draw your attention to is just for clarity, the me mechanism, the modeled mechanism for CTL killing. I'm using a mass action um, dynamic between the effector cell population and the infected cell population here. And there's a killing rate M, which we um, rescaled so that it's between zero and one. We have to model um, stimulation, we have a Hill function and exhaustion, we have a Hill function. So these are competing mechanisms at different thresholds. Now you may ask, so I should also say that this is kind of a Frankenstein model. We didn't wanna cook the books too much. So we put together existing established, published and peer reviewed models for latency and for these effector cell dynamics. And Therefore, we also use whenever possible publish parameter estimates, again, so that we could, um, to avoid the perception or the reality of cooking the books. So whenever possible, we use parameter published estimates and this was cobbled together from existing models. Um, so I'm gonna use this model to test, to investigate the hypothesis that post-treatment control can be achievable via these effector cell responses if the latent reservoir size is sufficiently small. And to make a long story short, let's just dive right in. Uh, here I'm showing the bifurcation diagram. Um, now this is, admittedly, this is a projection of the bifurcation diagram onto the um, V um, effector cell killing rate M plane. But because latent, cell, latent infection really drive most of the model, this is, a safe bifur this is a safe abstraction to make. What we have here, is on the x-axis, I have the uh, rescaled effector cell killing rate. So the efficacy with which effector cells are killing infected cells, the strength of the effector cell response. 
the y-axis, I have the um, steady state viral loads. So let's take so these are steady state viral loads. And we'll notice what we have here is that for small, smaller effective self-killing rate, we have just a viral rebound state, a large, um, large viral load. These numbers are consistent with observed observations of chronic infection. For mid-range effector cell killing rates, we do see this bistability. The dashed line indicates an unstable branch. And so we have bistability between the post-treatment control state, this very low, un undetectable viral load and a high viral load. And then out here on the far right, we just have a steady state as the long-term behavior, zero. So I have two comments to make about, two further comments to make about this. First, the zero is not really zero, right? This is the long time behavior. This is the steady state. And this just fell out of the model. We call this akin to elite controllers because elite controllers are known to have protective HLA alleles and especially potent T cell responses. And this is especially potent T cell responses. So we argue that these effective, these um, elite controllers have viral loads here and they're able to spontaneously control infection. That's not the case in this mid-range, but in this mid-range we have bi-stability. And so this, I claim at the bottom of the page that this bi-stability is biologically indicated. And I make that claim because the Visconti cohort, those individuals, their documented HIV infection before treatment was by all accounts, totally normal totally 100% normal. They were hitting their chronic state, chronic viral load within um, anticipated ranges. They were not elite controllers. In fact, the emphasis of say the 2013 paper was to demonstrate that this was indeed a different phenomenon from elite control. And so we have this, so, that, so it, this bi-stability is biologically indicated. Right. Um, and so we can see different dynamics, different dynamics. Now, I said, let's see, what did I say? I said that it depended on the strength of the immune response and the size of the latent reservoir. So here I'm see, showing the size of the latent reservoir. If you have a larger latent reservoir, but you see that um, following treatment interruption on the x-axis, you've got time, y-axis is viral load, time equals zero is treatment interruption. The viral load re um, rebounds and hits chronic level, chronic high levels. But for a lower viral load, the model predicts infection control. In fact, this stays below the detection threshold. And um, this is the image that is in the paper on this study, but I do want to point to actually, there are some qualitatively different dynamics that one can also produce with this model. For example, um, there is some qualitative variation in the um, appearance of post-treatment control, depending on the activation rate with a related parameter set also from the literature. Uh, we find that following treatment interruption, so that treat, in this particular case, the treatment interruption is right there after two years, there is a large viral peak. And then control is established again, or for a different activation rate, you get a large viral peak and control is established. So post-treatment control can also be achieved in this model via excursions large viral load excursions. And this is actually consistent with observations that were later in the literature, that 45% of post-treatment controllers had a peak that was higher than 1,000 copies per mil, so that's about here. And that 33% had something higher than, like a full third had something higher than 10 to the five copies per mil, uh, 10 to the four, sorry, right there. So, um, we see these patterns of rebound in the model, which are consistent with observations. Uh, now I mentioned we can look more directly at the relationship between latent reservoir size and effector cell killing rates, since those are the, the two main components of the hypothesis. On the x-axis, we have our effector cell killing rate here. The y-axis, I have a latent reservoir size. Now these are the basins of attraction, so this is an attraction figure. And what we observe is, that the larger the latent reservoir is, the larger the effector cell killing rate must be in order to achieve post-treatment control. So uh, that's what this curve indicates. And that for most reasonable uh, reservoir sizes, you get no control. Again, over here, I have the elite control window for very potent, for um, modeled potent T-cell responses.
So what did I show you? I showed you a viral dynamic model that includes a latent reservoir and effector cell responses that can reproduce the phenomenon of post-treatment control. Now, in principle, if this model were well, well validated with data, which hasn't quite been available, uh, we might be able to use it as a platform to generate testable predictions on the role of efficacy, uh, I'm sorry, of interventions. Uh, for example, latency reversing agents. Now, they've had uh, not a huge amount of success so far, but in principle, their aim is to reduce the latent reservoir size and hopefully land you in this post-treatment control potential functional cure state. Therapeutic vaccination can boost immune responses. Um, there's a CRISPR-Cas system now under investigation attempting to excise HIV. They've shown success in um, animal models uh, producing this goal. And then we might be able to induce post-treatment control and viral rebound delays. But, well, the way these are usually tested is you give whatever intervention you want to the, the volunteer who gives generously of their time and then you take them off, off antiretroviral therapy and then you monitor them. You keep an eye on what their viral load is. You test them at some frequency. And that way you can see if your intervention had some effect, but rebound itself is a highly heterogeneous process. So the second question I wanna ask is when, when does virus rebound? And the context for that is how can we evaluate the efficacy of these treatments. And since I'm switching gears here, um, I thought this would be a good time to ask if there are any questions so far. No questions, everything. No questions so far. <laughs> All right. All right, so here are, here's the figure that I showed you before or the modified version. Uh, we've got 235 patients post um, antiretroviral treatment interruption. And I would like to model to describe baseline viral rebound times. And the clinical relevance here is, as I indicated, design and evaluation of novel strategies for HIV cure. Now I should point out my collaborator here. The, these represents data um, from a, uh, across multiple ACTG studies. These are the AIDS clinical trial group. And they were collated and collected and analyzed by John Lee at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in the United States. Right, so I'm interested in when, and so this is the data, but for my purposes, I'm going to be focusing on when viral rebound occurs. So I'm gonna be looking at a time window and that's what's given by these two empirical accumulative density fun distribution functions here. The, this is the time of the last undetectable viral load across all individuals. And this is the time of the first detectable viral load. So this is the window in which I expect viral rebound to occur. So this is how I'm gonna be looking at the data soon enough. So again, x-axis time, y-axis is the cumulative fraction that have rebounded or probability of rebound as I will interpret it later. And I'm gonna show you these windows later and show you how my model compares to the window here. Now, some of you are probably sitting there thinking, well, why is she even bothering? This is a standard survival analysis problem. We just use survival analysis, everything is fine. And it is true. Um, if you were to use survival analysis, this is an example using a few classic survival, um, classic distributions employed in survival analysis to make these predictions and do pure clinical trial design, it does actually a pretty good job for short-term rebound. So these are just, again, I indicated this gray shaded area here. So the x-axis is time since treatment interruption. Now the curve is cumulative probability of rebound because that's what I've been computing. And the great, and it does a good job for rapid rebound within two months but it does not do a good job capturing the long delays. It does actually a pretty poor job capturing the long delays. So you can't really see it here because it's sort of, the, because the lines are so thick in the shaded area it's thin in the upper graph, but this is about 15% of the individuals that it doesn't, doesn't do a very good job on. And so we wanted to develop, we wanted to better predict both simultaneously short and long-term dynamics um, by modeling the underlying viral dynamics, trying to come up with what's like a mechanistic hazard function. And so uh, here's my picture. This is the simple picture that I'm using for uh, uh, viral rebound 
triggered by the latent reservoir. So we've got time on my x time on the x-axis and the viral load on the y-axis. And there's my treatment interruption right there. Now, as has been previously suggested, these latent cell activations are can be, could be happening all the time. They're, they're, just, they're just happening all the time. But they don't necessarily have to induce rebound. For example, um, they, you, you, might, you might have ge um, viral genome in a poorly transcribed area. The, the host cell might not have enough proteins. It might not make a lot of virus. They might go extinct. It might not be in a good place. It might be a target poor environment. So we argue that the activation could be failed with some probability or succeed with one minus that probability Q. And then if this activation uh, is successful, there's actually some delay between when the viral load goes from activating to being detectable. So we've got the probability and we put that together using this, um, well, this is more of an intuitive explanation of what's going on. So I've got my probability of the nth activation activating at time at T minus tau times the probability that that's the first one to be successful times the probability of detection times times tau into summed over all the potential activations and integrated over all times tau up to T. So this is my sort of intuitive explanation of what's going on. I hope that's clear. The actual tools that I use, I use continuous time branching processes, which was fun to see other people talking about this stuff earlier. Um, in fact, uh, they are time inhomogeneous branching processes, as you will see shortly. I analyze them via probability generating functions, and it's all a lot of fun. So I'd be happy to talk about that later uh, for anyone who's uh, interested, and you should all be because it's brilliant. No, it's brilliant, brilliant tool set. Uh, anyway, so this is how I approach. This is my model of, and, and of course, this is, as with any mathematical model, quite simple. And I'm, but I'm going to use it to test how long until viral load is detectable after treatment cessation. So I've got my cessation at time zero, my latent reservoir size is all not. I've got some delay function D. I should say that I'm using a, a, um, a, a delta function, sorry, a delta distribution, or just like a step of fixed delay size because because other studies indicated that it was statistically indistinguishable cross distributions. Um, and we'll assume just some latent rate re activation rate. So there's my cumulative probability that I described on the previous slide. And there's my model. So this does a pretty good job, in fact, a better job, one could argue, on the short term viral rebound. But it does a terrible job explaining both short term and long term viral rebound. And since that was my goal, that's no good. But this motivated our investigation of recrudescence rates. And I should define that, that's sort of the net activation. It's the first successful activation rate that are heterogeneous in time. And we, we, we have, there's a number of things to motivate this. Um, one, first and foremost, the latent reservoir is heterogeneous. There's uh, a lot of really interesting work about the structure of the reservoir that's coming out, come out in the last five years or so that it's composed of clones of various sizes. We do expect the latent reservoir to decay in time pre-rebound because the, we haven't had rebound yet. So this is the driver of viral rebound and it's decaying. So you'd expect that to be decreasing a little bit. Um, because of these exponent, ex observations of exponential decay dynamics in the latent reservoir, also in viral load, we chose varying exponential functions to describe the recrudescence rate. So let me be clear. The recrudescence rate is the probability of, is, is the rate of successful activation. So it's the probability that you've got that the, the activation rate times the number of latently infected cells times the probability that that activation will be successful. I'm making this time heterogeneous now. So I'm just gonna make this a net rate here. These weren't identifiable anyway in the previous model. It was just a, a lump um, parameter estimation. So I put them together, they're time dependent and I ex investigate alternative expressions for this recrudescence rate. And I chose exponential dynamics based on observations that so many things are exponentially decaying. For example, the latent reservoir, viral loads. I tested these three, these four functional forms. Now these are all um, exponentially decaying in different ways. So 
the black one is exponentially decaying to zero. The second one is exponentially decaying to a constant. The green one is exponentially decaying in a biphasic matter to decay to, it's a biphasic decay to zero. And the blue curve is a biphasic decay to a constant. Now we did our model comparison using the um, Ikeke information criterion, looking for the minimum. And the um, exponent, assuming an exponential decay rate that went to zero directly actually did very poorly as compared to the null model, which is the constant activation model. We saw a significant improvement with all three of the others. Uh, the best one was just the exponential decay to a constant, but for Claire, but I should admit to, or I should have make the observation that these are not statistically significant differences. These are these differences largely arise out of the number of parameters. I'm sticking with this one because it also it's the, it's the most parsimonious and it also has um, the best resolution of parameters. So these are low, but the uncertainty in the parameters, the model fits produced were very high. So when I say I've got exponential decay to a constant, and I'm gonna show you the outcome in a second, I'm, I don't wanna exclude the other poss possibilities. I just don't think we have enough data to resolve a biphasic decay or a triphasic decay. I think they are, I think it might very well be, we just don't have the data to resolve it. Right, so what does this look like? It does a great job with rapid rebound. So again, x-axis is the time since treatment interruption, y-axis is a cumulative probability of rebound. The gray shaded area is my data, that area between, that key, between the cumulative distribution functions of the last undetectable and first detectable viral load tests across all the study individuals. It also captures long delays really, really nicely. And so our winner, as it were, is this. But why? The fact is we did just try kind of arbitrary functions and it worked really well and that's great, um, but why? And so we're what we're doing now is we're taking a step back and trying to understand what the modeling implications, sorry, what the biological implications might be for our result and look for alternative support. But before I get to that, one of the uses of this, as I indicated at the outset, would be for clinical trial design and so even if you're skeptical of the underlying biology, you have to admit that's a good fit and it's a better fit than the survival models. And so what we did, what, what one can do is to treat the recrudescence rate as a hazard rate for analysis um, and use it as a baseline to evaluate the efficacy of intervention in a clinical trial setting. So uh, a, an important example is predicting the number of study participants one would need in order to achieve some desired statistical power. So that's what this graph shows. This is um, from simulations of a thousand in silico trials, presenting the percent that expressing the predicted statistical power as the percent that yields statistically significant difference in mean rebound time. So I'm doing this uh, Wilcox and rank sum test. And uh, these curves, so the power is on the y axis, and the number of participants per study arm is on the x axis. We've got the different colors represent uh, the different delays that one might have in our hypothetical invented intervention. And the line styles are associated with frequency of testing during the hypothetical clinical trial. The point is we can do these calculations with a good hazard function and a good hazard function is what we have. What's more with good support for the underlying biological hypotheses, which is in progress, uh, one could make similar predictions for interventions that target different mechanisms of rebound. So um, if you've got something that particularly affects Q. So um, one of the things that my graduate student is working on right now is looking at how uh, neutralizing antibodies might affect this picture. And she's finding that, and this is preliminary, mostly it affects the delay between the recrudescence and the detectable infection. Right, um, how am I doing on time? Oh, my goodness, I must be talking very rapidly. Usually I don't make it to this part of the talk. In order to try to get some sense of what's going on with the previous model, and this is very much what's in progress and unpublished and in progress, I wanna stress that, we looked at a stepwise recrudescence rate instead. We've got two steps. So this is a slightly worse model. 
It does er, re early rebound fine and it does okay with the rebound delays. Um, and because of that, because it still does okay, even though we're just doing this two constant, we're already talking about a latent reservoir and suggests that this latent reservoir might be composed of, which is huge and heterogeneous, can be thought of as two major subpopulations, cells that activate frequently and deplete rapidly and cells that can activate infrequently. That's the first thing. Then we can start looking at, oh, sorry. There, we've got our activation. So my recrudescence rate per day, the model predicted here for early times for the first month or so, it's dominated by cells that activate rapidly and then you've got cells that activate more slowly. Then we can start looking at different determinants and, and biomarkers and characteristics of infection. For example, when was our in, ART initiated in, these, in this cross-section of individuals? And some were initiated during acute infection, some during chronic infection, later than six months post-exposure, and some in between. We make this distinction because John Lee in his analysis noticed that there was a difference in rebound times between these two groups and hypothesized that had to do with the opportunity for immune responses to develop. And we recapitulate those results. So on the left, I have my predicted stepwise recrudescence rates as a function of time. So there's my recrudescence rate and there's the time since treatment interruption. The solid line are the predictions for the chronic treated, the blue dashed line for the early treated and the red dotted for the acute treated. These are people treated during those phases. Now just, before, I'll come back to this figure, but quickly I just wanna show you that it does a pretty good job predicting, um, pre predicting the rebound times across these two groups, the separation. It's also a statistically significant improvement on the previous fit that I showed you. So it is of value according to Akaiki. Uh, now coming back to this, you'll know, we can notice, first we notice that, yep, the, those that were in fact treated during the chronic stage of infection have highest recrudescence rates across the board earlier and later. Intriguingly, the lowest recrudescence rate in early times are people treated during early infection. And so our hypotheses there, the adaptive immune responses are better developed than in the acute treated as John Lee um, suggested, or that and or that fewer accumulated CTL escape mutations are established relative to chronic infection, right? Because you still have, the, if effector cell responses are controlling infection, escape is not great. You'll also notice that the, um, the acute treated recrudescence rate early time is the shortest. Um, maybe it's because it's got the smallest reservoir, maybe it's the smallest um, fast activating reservoir. One of the hypotheses there that we've discussed, but is not totally, um, remains, remains a topic of discussion is that this would be the smallest HIV specific reservoir that when you go off um, your treatments, the pathogen available is HIV. So you're triggering HIV specific immune responses and they'd have the smallest reservoir. So um, let's see, we discussed the post-treatment control model. So we've got including latent, latent reservoir and effector cell responses that can reproduce post-treatment control and a time rep dependent recrudescence rate model that can explain the observations of viral rebound. We've got if and when that we've discussed and we're working on trying to understand. And that's all she wrote. I should highlight my collaborators. There's John Lee and I did um, some of the post-treatment control work and as a postdoc, it's a little bit older but it felt a little more suitable to this meeting. And that was with uh, Alan Perelson, who's the king of viral dynamics. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>